I'm Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 21, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show for the past couple of weeks from the top of the show at 6.05 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss Senator Burt Stedman's bootstrapped, and other fiscal red herrings he discussed in a recent radio interview. Second, we discussed the problem with former Senator Joe Pascavans and others' single-focus fiscal solutions. And third, we look at a recent comprehensive report on solutions to the South Central gas situation. And now, let's join Michael. Today, we're going to start off with uh, Bert Stedman and his red herring. He just has, uh, he's, he's, he keeps getting quoted by everybody. All the news media just wants to go to him and, and see what the walrus has to say. So what do you, what do you say here this morning for us? What's I going on? The, I am the walrus. Is that the, um, yeah, exactly. A- a- actually, as I thought about it this morning, it's actually a bootstrapped red herring, uh, okay. that, uh that, that he's been pushing. There's an article in Alaska Public Media that comes out of the Sitka uh, Public Media radio station. Um, The headline of it is, Stedman warns against overdrawing Alaska permanent fund to pay dividends. And um, and, and basically, it's an interview with Bert where he goes off on, we can't pay dividends because it would overdraw the permanent fund earnings. You know, we can't do that. And I'm going to stand against that. Stand in the doorway. And uh, and and protect that from uh, from protecting that from ever ever happening. Well, what he's what he's arguing about is he's arguing two things in there. But but one of them is that uh, the permanent fund earnings reserve is in danger of being drained, um, and so we have to cut PFDs because we don't. In part, we have to cut PFDs because we don't want to overdraw the the permanent fund earnings reserve, and. It, and that's the bootstrap part because the permanent fund earnings reserve, as we've talked about on previous shows, the permanent fund earnings reserve is in trouble because Bert has overdrawn it uh, the past uh, few years to put to stuff more money into uh, the permanent fund corpus. So wait, you're completely- saying this is a crisis of his own making? Is that what you're saying? This is just it. I made the crisis and now I'm going to, yeah, I mean, this is, there's some real sleight of hand stuff going on here. Oh, it's, 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 I mean, and he does this all, you know, with a straight face and oh, it's just, you know, fact. How can anybody argue with that? But, but he's, but he's, you know, he's, he's bootstrapped himself into this, as you say, into this crisis uh, over the permanent fund earnings. And so all of a sudden now we have to cut PFDs. It's like, he's, you know, making up like Johnny Appleseed of, of no PFD stories, right? He's just sprinkling these these seedlings out out there, and then he's just going to harvest them as they as they come to fruition. So, so that's that's part of it. He's bootstrapped himself into this argument, and then it's a red herring um, uh, for two reasons. One is uh, the 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 most important is it's not the permanent fund dividend that's causing the overdraw. The permanent fund dividend is set by statute. And if the legislature would just recognize the statute, just appreciate the fact they can't, they don't have the votes to change the statute. And so they ought to be, they ought to be, you know, observing it, paying attention to it. Um, it, 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 The permanent fund dividend is funded, period. End of statement, end of discussion. It is other spending 
that is causing the overdraw. Uh, if, if there is an overdraw, it's, it's the other spending that's causing an overdraw uh, of the permanent fund earnings because there's not enough traditional revenues. They don't have the other spending doesn't or the spending rather doesn't have enough revenues to support it. Um, and so and so if there is a if there is a, a reason for an overdraw, it's not the permanent fund dividend that's doing it. It's the other spending that's doing it. And finally, you know, the 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 red, the the other, the third red herring. We got the big strapped red herring, the first red herring, and the third red herring. The third red herring that's going on is that is that there's no need for an overdraw in the first place. We're short revenues. And if we're going to have and, and if we have an additional need for revenues, cutting the PFD, which is what Bert's proposing and how he's boot and why he's bootstrapped himself into this position, cutting the PFD has the, as we've said on the show hundreds of times, no doubt by now, has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on 80% of Alaska families. And so if there if there is a reason for additional revenues, there are other ways to raise those revenues that have a lower impact on the economy and have a lower impact on Alaska families. And to, and to, and to focus on the PFD as he does is a red herring, uh, a top 20% uh, oil company red herring of saying, oh, yeah, don't come after me. Even though, even though it's better to raise revenues for me, don't come after me. Go after those guys over, you know, behind the tree, the old... Uh, the right. old Russell Long uh, admonition of "Don't tax me, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax that guy behind the tree," and right. and that and that's Bert's you know third red herring. Don't tax me, don't tax. I mean, it's bad to tax me. It's bad to tax you. Tax those guys behind the tree. So that's it, it's just it's just a string of red herrings uh, delivered, you know, with this low monotone voice. Yeah, uh, yeah. the voice of authority, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's once you understand the game, once you understand what's really going on with these PFD cuts, it just sort of gets humorous after a while. But, but with the, 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 the added thing that just really, you know, got me laughing as I read through it was the bootstrap of it. You know, I caused this crisis. <laughs> we have a crisis and now, you know, let's do what I, let's do my favorite thing. Let's go cut PFDs. Well, and what was interesting to me is there's actually even another one in there. Oh my god, I missed one. <laughs> he, well, he talks specifically about um, fully funding inflation proofing. We could skip inflation proofing for a year or two. We could reduce it. We could do, but inflation proofing. Remember, one of the big selling points of the POMV formula was that the inflation proofing was automatic. It wasn't because usually we used to have to put money in specifically for inflation proofing. One of the big selling points of SB 26 was that the inflation proofing was automatic. Well, now they're adding even more money back into the corpus of the permanent fund while they're still doing inflation, even though they don't need to really do it because it's baked into the formula. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, he's uh, he he's he's got them lined up. He's got all the all the bootstraps lined up. Um, so it's it's I mean. The, 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 the interview is the problem is people take this stuff seriously, right? The problem is people say, Oh my God, we got a crisis with the permanent fund earnings. Bert, you caused it. No, no, no. We got a crisis with the permanent fund earnings. Yeah. Um, and, and people believe that now, you know, it's like, you know, run it, run into the other side of the boat. We got a crisis over there. And then it's, and then it's, Oh, we yeah, have the PFD. That's the problem. This is the old Natasha line. It's the PFD. That's the problem. You entitled people, you're the ones that are that are that are the problem. Uh no, it's not PFD's fine. It's the other, it's the other spending that's the problem. And we got to cut the PFD. It's just it's one thing after another. And you know, the press interview, the 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 interview with Bert is just Bert. I mean, there's yeah. no counter, there's no, no let's go get let's it's a puff piece. I mean, essentially, it's like here, here's a free microphone, do whatever you want to do. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he's running for re-election uh, uh, this time or not. I haven't looked at whether his seat is one of the ones that's up. But it's, I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, let's go. You, you, you know, a, a journal journalism one hundred and one is let's get both sides. Let's let's balance. Let's do a balanced presentation. Let's do. Let's not let one side have the microphone or have the have the pen and and deny it the other side. That's what the op-ed page is for, right? 
You know, right. let somebody let somebody submit to the op-ed page. Journalism 101 is let's have a let's have a balance. This is just, you know, this well, is just let Burke go. Well, and, and all these red herrings and all the bootstrapping basically is all leading to one thing. Bert is pushing this idea that uh, we need a constitutional amendment to prevent the overdraw of the fund. Again, locking all that money in there. He's got there's an agenda here. His agenda is to push for this this new, um, you know, he may call it even a spending cap, but it's <clears throat> basically a withdrawal cap from the permanent fund, uh, uh, I guess the, the corpus of the fund of the earnings reserve so that they can again control and again, keep that crisis point hot by controlling and constricting that money. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's trying to remake, um, this, 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 this fight goes all the way back, right? I mean, it's a fight that, that the legislature had in the, in the 1980s, uh, over the permanent fund dividends, a fight they even had in the 1970s over the permanent fund itself when there was the battle about people who wanted to keep the oil revenues, the excess oil revenues, and, you know, build skyscrapers all over the place and, you know, uh, fill out fill out the infrastructure by by spending all the money um, after they drained the Prudhoe Bay bonus that they got in, 19, in 1973. This fight goes all the way back. And Bert's just the latest iteration of the anti-Hammond forces, the forces of that that want to spend and want to, you know, control the spending, want to funnel all the spending through the, you know, twenty-one plus eleven plus one, the the, the through thirty-three people through through thirty-two, yeah, thirty-three people, um, and wants to funnel all the money through the legislature as opposed to the Hammond forces who wanted to distribute the money out. Let Alaskans have a share, a share right. of the of the state's wealth, uh, and and use a portion of the state's wealth in the way that that they thought the six hundred and twenty five thousand now uh, residents thought was the was the right way to go uh, with using that money. Bert's, you know, Bert's the old peacock, uh, uh, the old uh, uh, Hickel, uh, the old. Uh, 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 forces that uh, that wanted to keep uh, keep the money in government's hands and let government control. It's just the latest iteration. But now he's in a position, you know, people, you, you know, you talk about changing out the players, and that's that's certainly important. You want to get to twenty one eleven and and one that 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 supports your position. But Bert, as chairman of Senate Finance, is probably the key position that that has caused that's causing all this along the way i mean he's the one that's created that's bootstrapped us into the into the crisis over the permanent funds earnings reserve he's the one that's driven using pfd cuts you know taxing the pfd as opposed to as opposed to a broad-based tax which would reduce the impact on the alaska economy reduce the impact on alaska family he's the one who's really you know created this so it's it, if you want to, you know, what, what's what's maybe mo more important, as important as changing the the legislators, is 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 changing that caucus vote inside the Senate uh, for who's Senate Finance Chair, uh, and and getting that under control of the Hammond forces as opposed to the as opposed to the the historic anti Hammond forces that want right. to control right. control the money. Well, changing the players is a great idea, and we've done a good job of it across the state. Unfortunately, there's a handful of players that are in positions of power. They have the, uh, you know, they have the historic knowledge, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, as to how to play the game. They know how to, you know, what they need to go for. They need what positions. They know what positions they need, and they continue to get back into those leadership positions. And so they're basically running the show, even though we've got a bunch of brand new people in there. They're basically running the show with this institutional knowledge that they have. And, uh, you know, it just it means that we need to find a way to counter them at their district level and offer some other option. And that's just as of right now, it's just it's not happening. You know, whether it's the Gary Stevens or the Click Bishops or the Burt Stedmans uh, and now the renewed Kathy Geisel. I mean, those are the folks that are all the more big government type, you know, government spend type Republicans. Um, and that those are the ones that are kind of holding up everything else. But that those finance positions, especially, are the key to this whole thing. They they are they are Michael. And we thought you know we thought we'd we'd had some of that by electing Dunleavy governor, right? I mean, Alaska reputedly throughout the nation is 
has the one of the strongest forms of governor, has the line item veto that requires three quarters of the legislature to overturn him, um, and 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 not just one body, both bodies uh, in the legislature to overturn him. Uh, and and you know you thought you had a, a strong governor, but. Now, it turns out we don't have that either. So it's yeah, exactly Brad. It, Brad, the thing is, you look, it's like he looks into the camera and says, I'm just shocked. Shocked, I tell you, that we don't have enough money in the permanent fund earnings reserve. And I mean, I know we put maybe a bit, and I love how he's so casual about it. He's like, mm, I think we put like over a little over a billion dollars back in, you know, something like like he doesn't know down to the dollar what's going on here. This is a guy that's directing all the traffic, but he's so casual, like, well, I think we put a few hundred million, maybe a billion dollars. You know, you orca- you're the architect of this whole thing. And he's acting like, well, no, I don't have the exact details, but it, uh, is it? I mean, it's. It's so disingenuous at this point. It's a, it's a crisis of your own making at this point. Yeah, when he talks about when he talks about inflation proofing, it it is it is humorous, you know, talking about oh, we put we we could go a couple of years. Of, you prepaid, Bert. You prepaid inflation proofing. You put four billion in one year. You put four billion in another year, and those were to, those were to prepay inflation proofing. Of course, you can go, you yeah. know, several years now uh, without contributing to inflation proofing. But you know. I, I may, I may, I may let inflation proofing go a couple of years. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, and, and the, and the problem is, is that most people don't understand the oh, vagaries and the details of how all this stuff works. And so they're, and they're trusting their news media to do a good job to try and get them the pros and cons and the, so they can make a balanced decision and things like that. And then the news media falls absolutely flat on any kind of, uh, you know, one side versus the other. It's, I mean, it's insane. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it is disappointing. I mean, part of the, part of the problem is, <laughs> I guess part of the challenge is when 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 others from the legislature or when from the governor's office, when they would, you know, if they were confronted with, OK, Bert says this, what do you say? I mean, the answer is we're going to have to talk about taxes. We're going to have to talk about revenues in some form. If we can't get this spending under control and we haven't and we aren't, we're going to have to talk about taxes. And you know, and the, and the, and those who are on the other side of this issue don't want to say that word. They don't want to, they don't want to talk about it. Even though you can say, look, PFD cuts are taxes. We're ha- we have taxes. Now we have the most regressive tax system in the nation. Now we have an ICER professor who's been here since the beginning, since 1982 doctorate um, uh, from Harvard or Yale, wherever it's from, uh, who's looked at this issue all the way along, who says, this is the most regressive tax in the nation ever, um, even though, and and we have, that's what we have down. So we're not talking about no taxes. We're talking about a different form, a, a, a lower impact, low, more equitable form of taxes, even though you have people who could say that, um, you know, uh, they just don't want to say it. So part of the problem is you don't have, you don't have people in the legislature and in the administration who are willing to counter Bert. Uh, by saying the thing that needs to be said. And so, you know, Bert sort of gets free run. And if somebody, you know, if they want to talk to somebody else, they, you sort of get mush. I mean, you get you get people who say, oh, well, we need to cut spending. Well, we tried that. And everybody in the state knows that didn't work and knows it's not going to work because because the legislature is not going to pass it. So um, it, it's it's tough to find that counter. But but, you know, and so and so maybe the the, the journalists have just given up trying. They know they're not going to find one. Oh, geez. Maybe. Uh, I mean, I I think, well, I think you're giving them too much credit at this point. I think it's easy to look the to look the the powers that be in the eye and say, please tell us, oh, wise ones, what we should print at this yeah. point, because it's just too difficult to go out and find somebody with an alternate point of view that makes, you know, that makes sense. Uh, but unfortunately, that's where we're at right now. We're on to number two of the weekly top three. And in number two, we talk about the problematic uh, behavior, the problem with Joe Pascovan uh, and others across the state. Joe is a former legislator from Fairbanks, making some commentary here. Uh, Brad, let's dive into that. Give me give me the details here. 
So Joe wrote an op-ed, former Senator uh, Joe Pascavan uh, from Fairbanks wrote, a, wrote an op-ed that says oper- Alaska's operating money could be exhausted. You know, the same, we, we start with the same premise right, as, right. as as Burt's bootstrap. Oh my God, we have a crisis in the right. earnings reserve. Right. They have talking points? I mean, how does that work? Right. <laughs> That's right. You want to you want to see the memo that's distributed, right? Here's the crisis of the day. Alaska's anyway. The title of the piece is Alaska's operating money can be exhausted. Get rid of SB 21. And SB 21, for those that don't recall, was the oil tax bill back in the early 20 teens that that redid the oil taxes, undid aces, and redid the oil taxes to to set the oil tax structure, basically the oil tax tax structure uh, uh, that we have now. Um, and Joe goes on and on as he as he has, and as Bill Wolikowski has over time, goes on and on about SB21 and how SB21 is the cause. If we would only repeal SB21, uh, then you know birds would sing, flowers would bloom, uh, Alaska would be you know would be back in balance, and we would never have to worry worry unicorns again. And unicorns and puppies, unicorns <laughs> yeah. and puppies everywhere. That's right, Dan- dancing through the field, whatever whatever image you want to you want to do. Look. You and I have talked on the program a lot about the fact there that the money is or that the, the the state is leaving money on the table with respect to the oil companies. There is more money uh, uh, from the oil companies uh, that we could that, that could be taxed, should be taxed, consistent with the constitutional obligation um, and 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 taken by the state. And it would not have a, 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 a an adverse impact on oil company incentives to explore for and develop. Uh, additional production. Um, it's about, it's clearly a hundred million dollars from Hillcorp, um, which, uh, which is benefiting from the Hillcorp loophole, uh, in how they have uh, structured their corporation differently than BP so that they pay a hundred million dollars less than BP would, uh, had, uh, had BP continued. Uh, and then there's additional money, uh, out there on the table from, uh, from, uh, the production tax that uh, that even the Dunleavy administration at one point, although they seem to have forgotten that now under Adam Crum, uh, that the that the Dunleavy administration admitted could be uh, could be taken from the oil companies, and that's four another 400, 450 million. So we're talking 500, 550 million, 600 million uh, total. There is there is money on the table, but here's the point: the point is it's not enough anymore. Uh, the spending has has escalated to the point, and oil prices have dropped to the point uh, that that we have this growing gap, this growing fiscal gap uh, in the state. Once we did the crossover, once in the early 20 teens, when we did the crossover between spending outstripping uh, outstripping revenues, it's just continued to to continued to widen uh, over time, and it's a little bit narrower now because oil prices are up, but it's still huge. Uh, over the past five years, the de- now keep in mind so that we got 500, 550 million, 600 million, 600, 700 million, 750 million. You know, l- let's let's just say those are the those those are the numbers that we're dealing with uh, in terms of uh, undertaxing oil. The la- over the last five years, the deficit, even with the boom years that we had in oil prices a couple of years ago, even with those boom years. Uh, the deficit has averaged over the last five years, de- averaged 1.05 billion, about about one bill one billion one hundred uh, million, 1.1 billion. Oil is, you know, we got we got more to get from oil in terms of 500, 556. You know, pick a number, but it's not 1.1 billion. Over the next ten years, the deficit rises to 1.7 billion per year. And by the end of the decade, by 2032, on the trajectory we're on, the deficit is 2.5 billion per year. So we're dealing we're, we're dealing with numbers that start out in the in the early 20 teens, start out in the in the hundred million hundreds of millions, but still low hundreds of millions. And now we're now we're over a billion. The past five years have been over a billion. And we're going to, you know, over two billion by, by the end of the by the end of the decade. So yes, oil is there is more on the table to be gotten from oil, but it's not enough, given even the spending that that you know the Dunleavy administration has approved over the last five years. Dunleavy signed off on over the last five years, 
it's certainly not enough given what we're what we're seeing over the next 10 years as spending rises and oil rev and oil production and oil prices uh, uh, moderate so the my problem with Pascavan anymore and my problem with Willikowski frankly anymore is that yeah 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 let's 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 go tax oil that's 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 something that should be part but it's only part we need to do more we need to constrain spending some we need to have some restructuring of the PFD to POMV 5050. We need to have oil taxes as a part of it, but there has to be some other form other than PFD cuts. There has to be some other form of personal taxes as well that would be low impact, have the have the lowest uh, adverse impact on the economy and have a low impact on, on Alaska families. It's an all of the above. What we're really talk is, talking about is an all of the above strategy. And my problem with Pascavan and Wilikowski is they keep they keep focusing on this one thing, like if we just do that, then unicorns and puppies and flowers blooming and, you know, spring and rainbows and all that sort of stuff. It's not going to happen anymore. I mean, that's not what the numbers tell you anymore. Well, and so, and so, you know, Joe needs to get off this kick. Bill needs to get off this kick that it's just this one thing. Right. The Alaska, the, the, the fiscal policy working group, the legislature's fiscal policy working group got it right. They looked at it in detail. They understood the issue. They got it right. It's all of the above. Right. And for, and and we just need to get off this kick that is, if you just do my one thing, we'll be okay. Well, a couple of different things. First and foremost, Willikowski and others have constantly used a number of, well, we're, we're losing $1.2 billion, right? That's the number that you keep hearing floating around, that there's $1.2 billion that we should be taxing from the oil companies. But based on what you just said of the projected deficit of $1.7 billion, the 1.2 still doesn't do it all. So it's not, it can't just be that uh, on the, you know, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, uh, the other part, is that as you as you look at this and you see what these guys are saying, they're constantly coming back to the same idea of of we can only fix this one thing that there should be no other no other discussion, no other no other uh, point. And it's just it's not going to work. And the, and the worst part to me was what you just said is even with the big years i mean what was it year, two years ago natasha von imhoff was quoted from somebody on the floor saying we've got so much money we don't know what to do with it i mean kind of thing they had such a bunker year but even with the bumper crop year we're still averaging a billion 1.1 billion dollar a year in deficit. i mean even with that 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 skews the average i mean that's horrific what happens if it goes the other way and then what does the deficit do i mean it's a it's this is crazy at this point. It is. And and certainly spending cuts need to be part of it. But we're not spending cuts alone aren't going to do it. Oil taxes alone aren't going to do it. PFD cuts. I mean, you have to eliminate the PFD by the end of the decade if we keep going, you know, the the, the leftover approach, the PFDs. There's still not enough money even with that. Right. right. And, mean, and, and that. none of none of this, none of this is enough to, to resolve the fiscal situation we're in. I mean, some people say, oh, we're going to get increased oil production. Well, the problem is the increased oil production, at least from Willow, doesn't have royalties. And royalties is a big part of the revenue stream. Uh, and PICA has, has you know, phased their project now. The first phase is only going to be 80000 a day. That's 80000 a day, but we're dropping, you know, we, we're having a decline curve from the existing sources. So that really just sort of you know, over the, over the, certainly over the 10 year period, even over the five year period, that just sort of replaces what, what, what's in the, what's in the decline curve. So you, we've got it. We've got to grow up. We've got to become adults and we've got to say, okay, I understand now that one, that this one thing is not going to create unicorns and puppies and, you know, rainbows and all that sort of stuff. We've got to do just like the fiscal policy working group did. We've got to do a number of, we got to do a number of things together. And, and frankly, people who pick one and say, that's the deal, that's what's going to solve this, that's what's going to, that's what's going to, you know, create rainbows, rainbows and unicorns and puppies, people who pick one are part of the problem because they're not using their voice to educate the public that it's an all in solution, that, that everything has to be part uh, to get us back in balance. We don't have an unlimited future. We don't have an unlimited revenue stream. Right. We've got to curb our spending habits. We don't, and and we can't take it all from the oil companies. There is not enough 
blood in that stone to take it from. Um, uh, and so we've got to curb, you know, the expectations from the oil companies. We've got to curb the expectations of getting it all out of PFD cuts. Uh, and we've got to curb, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've never argued that we can do it all through taxes. I mean, we've got to do it as part of, as part of the all, all of the above solution. So I just, my problem with Joe in this op-ed uh, really is, Joe, use your voice, use your talents, use your position in the community to educate the public. It's got to be a number of things as opposed to just picking out that one thing and just, you know, continue to hammer on it time after time after time. Yeah, exactly. And again, no one solution is going to fix it. It has to be, uh, it has to be a holistic approach where you look at everything at once. It cannot be a sort of one single source solution for any of this, which Brad and I have talked about ad nauseum at this point. So Donna says, uh, the Senate's oil tax fiscal bill shows that there's no that there is not a billion dollars available. And I know that Donna. I was just saying that all these these chirping birds are always talking about, you know, whether it's Wilikowski or Paskman or Harold or whoever saying, oh, there's $1.2 billion. Even if there was 1.2, based on what Brad's talking about here, the, the future projections of 1.7 billion, it's still not enough. There is no one note solution to this whole thing. It's like everybody wants to fix the whole thing with a tweet. You can't do it in 148 characters. You know, you need to do it. You need to have a, a little bit of a, you know, of a summary and a, and a, you know, a 16 page projection, not a 148 character tweet, Brad. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right, Michael. I mean, it's what, what, you know, we sort of, we sort of get in our minds, I think, you know, static numbers and, and just sort of lock in on those and forget that they move. So in the early, you know, 20 teens, the deficit was 300, 400, 500 million dollars. It wasn't, it wasn't a billion. And so people think, okay, well, that was, that's when SB 21 was passed. You know, that's the, that's sort of the deficit that, that, that existed at the time. And so SB 21 is the solution because, uh, or repealing SB 21 is the solution because that was the deficit that created the deficit. And so we can, you know, so we can just undo that and, and we'll be fine. The, the problem is we're, the world keeps moving. You know, spending has continued to go up. Dunleavy has signed bills, has signed appropriations bills where spending continues to, to go up. Uh, revenues have continued to go down. Oil prices aren't $120 anymore as they were in the in the in the early 20 teens. Oil prices, you know, oil production isn't 700 million a day like it was in the early 20 teens. And 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 the world changes. And, and the world that has, the, the changes that have been going on in our world and will frankly continue to go on in, on in our world is is this is this gap that's op that continues to open between spending rising and re and traditional revenues going down. So when we think about solutions, we need to think about solutions that deal with that gap wherever we are in that gap at that point as opposed to, you know, locking in on what the numbers were back in the early 20 teens or the mid 20 teens or even the late 20 teens. We're, we're, we're beyond that world now. And, and we need to, we need to deal with uh, the, the, the real world dynamic that's going on as opposed to this past one. So, you know, that's, that's where a lot of this comes from. People just have a, a memory of, oh my God, you know, the deficit that got created after the after SB 21 could have been covered by SB 21, so it can still be covered by SB 21. Nope, can't. That's just not that's just not the world we live in anymore. And and it has to be an all in solution that includes in part, as the fiscal policy working group said, includes in part spending cuts, but but includes other things as well. Uh, again, that's not to say that you're not uh, necessarily a fan of SB 21. I remember we've had plenty of discussions on that uh, back and forth over the years. It's got issues. But again, no one note solution will fix what we have going on here. Yep, it, it, exactly right. And, and I, you know, I got to give credit uh, again. I, I think I've done it a lot, but I'm going to give credit again to the Fiscal Policy Working Group. They understood they studied it. They focused on it. Ben Carpenter and 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 you know Mike Shower and Shelley Hughes and Jeff you know Jonathan Deal. Christ, huh? Uh, yeah, Jonathan Christ Tompkins. Yeah, JKT. Uh, Jonathan Christ Tompkins. I mean Hoffman. I mean they understood the issue and they got their arms around it. The problem is 
you know, you go back to the rest of the legislature and the rest of the legislature says, no, 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 no. Oil taxes can do it or PFD cuts only can do it or, you know, some other, some other one, you know, one note solution can do it. Adam Wool, Adam Wool was great. You know, well, that's, that was the opinion of, of those legislators. My opinion is oil. We just revise oil taxes. We can do it. I, it's just, I mean, the fiscal policy working group dug into the issue, understood the issue, got the solution right. We just, we, we need to keep going with that solution. People who then, you know, veer off on these one note tactics, I just think are, are, are undoing the progress the fiscal policy working group made and, 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 and putting us, you know, farther back than, than we were then. Yeah, well, and that's the problem. I mean, uh, you know, I think Adam Wool's uh, opinion was a microcosm of what's going on. Too bad all these guys got together and spent a good chunk of their summer going over and doing all this stuff from both left and right, but totally bipartisan. Some of the most polar opposite people you can find in the legislature, they came together and unanimously kumbaya and said, these are the things that we need to do. And everybody else was like, oh, you know, that's your opinion. Wait, you, we... We were we were specifically hired or put together to do all these things. That makes no sense whatsoever. We're on to number three, which has to do with South Central and the gas supply. Now, this is, uh, you know, there's there's a little bit of panicky kind of noise creeping into the edges of this thing because some of the some of the folks who were in the know are like, what are, what are we going to do? We got to do something. We got to find something. So they're looking for sources of gas. Uh, sometimes from outside, I mean, it, the crying shame that we would actually have to import gas into a state that has trillions of cubic feet of gas underground. But, uh, anyway, Brad, you say the weekly top three, number three is the fact that somebody is finally, uh, somebody is, uh, being responsible out looking at South central gas supplies. Give me, uh, give me your take on it. Well, there's a report in the Petroleum News, which actually is a, a, a very good news source for those that don't follow it, don't read it, don't subscribe to it. Uh, Petroleum News Alaska is, is one of the sources that I sort of check on every day. Uh, and there's a headline in it that says, New Report su uh, Supports Importing of LNG to Fill Cook Inlet Gas Supply Gap. Now, that's the headline's a little misleading because it, 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 it implies that that's the only solution. It's not. It's not what the what the what the uh, what the report uh, actually says, but it, it is it is part of it. Here's the deal. Um, uh, as we've talked before on the show, uh, Hillcorp has told customers of uh, of Cook Inlet gas, which are really used to be Chugach and the municipality of Anchorage is now Chugach uh, Electric uh, Corp. Um, other electric suppliers down on the Kenai Peninsula uh, and NSTAR Natural Gas, uh, the the natural gas supplier to uh, South Central have told them that uh, the South Central that Hillcorp's gas supply and Hillcorp's the primary supplier out of South Central, Hillcorp's gas supply is going to be insufficient for it to renew contracts uh, as they at the current volumes uh, as they come up, and so there's there's concern uh, by uh, South Central that or the the customers in South Central that uh, there's going to be a, a shortage. You know, if Hillcorp's not producing it, and there really aren't any other producers and in uh, uh, in in from Cook Inlet Gas, significant producers from Cook Inlet Gas, then you know what what are we going to do? And it's a legitimate concern, but people have been looking at it. Uh, the, there's a working group composed of uh, uh, composed of the utilities um, uh, from uh, from South Central, Matsu, uh, the Matsu Electric, uh, uh, Chugach Electric, uh, uh, Homer Electric. Uh, and NSTAR uh, that have been looking at the issue have hired consultants. And there's a recent consultant report from Black and Beach, uh, one of the one of the primary uh, 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 gas consultants out there, energy consultants out there, that that talks about the solution. Um, and the solution basically is uh, a number of things. One is, interestingly, to increase storage uh, storage capacity in the Cook Inlet, gas storage capacity in the Cook Inlet. One of the problems of gas is, is you produce, you, 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 the, the demand is fairly low in the summer, particularly in Alaska. It's fairly low in the summer, and then, it's, and then it spikes in the winter, uh, and then goes back on, down on the other side, and, uh, and is flat again uh, in, the, in the summer, lower again in the summer. Now, gas, however, doesn't produce in that same characteristic. Gas from the Cook Inlet uh, and other places produces on a fairly even basis. 
So the the issue, one of the issues we have is that we have excess gas capacity, production capacity in the summer, uh, but we but it's not the production isn't the production isn't high enough to meet the peak in the winter. And what you do in that with in that case is you develop storage. You take the excess gas production, you produce the gas in the summer, you stick it into storage, and then bring out storage as an additional supply source uh, in the winter. So one of the one of the pieces of the solution is to develop additional storage and 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 help us shave peaks, shave what are called winter peaks uh, in uh, in gas demand. That frankly, the last time we had the Cook Inlet problem in the early 20 teens, um, uh, that one of the solutions was for NSTAR to develop a storage field and to and to utilize storage to shave off the peaks, and that got us through this past decade, frankly. Um, so uh, that's one of the solutions is to expand storage. We still have a, lo a, a little bit of excess production capacity in the summer. We could take that and put it into storage and use it uh, in the winter. That'll get us a few years uh, 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 in terms of in terms of saving the uh, situation. Uh, another piece of it is some uh, renewable energy sources, some wind farms, some solar farms, even in Alaska. Uh, uh, and developing some renewable energy. I mean, one of the big consumers of Cook Inlet gas is is, elect is the electric generation uh, in um, in South Central. Um, and so another piece of that is to develop additional sources uh, of electric generation using renewable sources. And the state's spending a lot of money. The feds are spending a lot of money to develop those sources. But those aren't going to come on fast enough and those aren't going to be big enough to offset the, the the problem created by the Cook Inlet decline. So you've got two pieces there. You've got a little bit that's that's covered by gas storage. You've got a little bit that's covered by renewables. A third part of the piece, the consultants say, is uh, is the proposed Hillcorp sale to Fairbanks uh, of natural gas to Fairbanks, piped down in a short pipe uh, from uh, from uh, the North Slope, uh, to, or well, truck down, actually, LNG truck down uh, from the North Slope uh, uh, to uh, to Fairbanks. Fairbanks, interestingly enough, Fairbanks is, is sort of dependent on Cook Inlet gas in part by wire. It's electricity generated in South Central that's, gen, that's then uh, uh, transmitted up to, to Fairbanks and used to, to meet Fairbanks' right. supply. The rail belt, uh, right. Right. A part of it is a part of it is LNG that's trucked out of LN, uh, Cook Inlet LNG that's trucked out uh, of, of Cook Inlet and up to Fairbanks. So part of the problem is to get, or a part of the solution is to get Fairbanks off of that, is to, is to reduce the Fairbanks piece of that by bringing the, the Hillcorp uh, LNG down from the North Slope down to, uh, down to Fairbanks. But that still doesn't do enough. So, so what's the other piece of that? And frankly, it's fairly creative thought. Another piece of that is what they call floating LNG, and that is an LNG regas facility uh, that you can that you don't have to build on land. Not a big not a big kit. Uh, it's a floating barge uh, that uh, is an LNG regas facility. You bring the LNG up to the LNG tanker up to the the floating barge, uh, and then you regas on the barge and you bring it off. Two things about that: uh, one is it's not you're not putting in sunk costs. You can barge in the floating LNG, you can barge out the floating LNG plant when some when it, when your when your need is over if you if you satisfied it um, some other way. So you're not putting in a lot of sunk costs. Um, and the second uh, piece of it is additional su su supply um, into South Central. And I think that's been fairly creative thought. Floating LNG by the way is how Europe has met its increased uh, LNG uh, demand as a result of the Russian cutoff, as a result of them cutting themselves off from Russia supplies, Russian gas supplies, which was their primary supplier. They brought in floating LNG facilities and were able to bring in a lot of LNG, floating LNG regas facilities, and were able to bring in a, a lot of uh, LNG um, as, a, as a result of that very quickly. I mean, they, they, they solved their problem in 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 a time frame that nobody thought they could accomplish but they solved it by putting in these floating lng facilities so it's a it, it it's a very it's a very creative way of dealing with the additional uh, uh supply that you need after you've done um uh, uh storage and after you've done 
uh, uh, some uh, renewables and after you've uh, uh, addressed the, the Fairbanks uh, uh, piece of it. But we've got people who are going, I mean, li like the fiscal plan, we've got people who are going off. I mean, Will Lukowski has said, oh, the real solution is to force Hillcorp, you know, to invest more, to develop more supply that we think may be out there uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Cook Inlet or to, you know, force additional uh, production out there by, you know, forcing additional uh, producers to either join the fray or to, or to develop additional supplies that people think they have behind pipe or that are reach, re, reachable from their facilities. Well, good luck with forcing anybody to invest additional money uh, to develop a, additional supply out there. We got other people who say renewables are the only are, are the only solution, the only thing we need to do. Same thing as fiscal policy. We got all these little one-offs. It's an all-in policy, and I think the Black and Beach Report's a great place to go to understand what the all-in policy is. Well, and I found our creativity of like, you know, don't have to build storage facilities. You can use the beluga field that's already exhausted and use that to restore gas. And it seemed like it's a pretty comprehensive report. I haven't read the whole thing yet. But again, some other options stretching this out at least maybe another 10 years before we have to face it. Maybe something else changes in the meanwhile, and we're able to get some of that stranded gas from the nurse slope down to us. We'll see what happens here. Some of the interesting parts of this report, uh, just with the expansion of the storage um, they could, again, push the uh, the gap, the gas supply gap, uh, to somewhere near the end of this decade, maybe even into uh, halfway into the 2030s, which would give us, again, some more time to have new technologies developed or some other kind of change. I mean, it just gives you more options to push it down the road a little bit, uh, to have more options to look at as you come as you come back. Yeah, I, I I agree with that, Michael. And storage is certainly, I mean, as I say, that was a big part of how we how we addressed this issue uh, in the early 20 teens. The last time we had the last time we had a cook in a crisis, uh, the state poured a lot of money into into exploration or production incentives into the cook inlet i mean we had a lot of oil and gas tax credits that we poured into it that helped a little bit but uh but the big uh, the big impact was uh, was out of storage last time and it's good to see that uh that uh, we still have the option of of expanding the storage if there's still excess uh production capacity uh, uh in the summer that we can you know convert into storage and convert into uh, winter deliverability. So it's it's good to see that as well. But, you know, you, you read these op-eds that people write. I mean, the renewable community is all in on, let's spend a whole bunch of money developing all this renewable capacity. That'll get us out of the problem. Well, no, it won't. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, Willikowski's all in on, let's force the oil companies, force the oil companies to, to invest more, to develop additional supply. Uh, and you know that'll get us out of the problem. No, it won't. Um, and and even and even storage uh, it has its limits. I mean, at some point, yeah. there isn't enough excess capacity in the summer, excess production in the summer. To, the storage, to yeah. Storage. Storage. Ben Garbiter makes a comment. He said, "Consultants highlight renewable energy as an option because one, governments are willing to subsidize it, and two, it wouldn't be politically correct to omit it from the list." Which is, I mean, there, there's a whole argument to be had about the creation of. Uh, of uh, renewables and what does that actually cost in the long run? What's the real sunk cost of that? And what does it take? That's a whole nother, it's, it's a whole nother show, but I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, interesting. Um, the, the trucking from Fairbanks uh, has always been an interesting thing. They used to truck up gas from Anchorage when there was excess production. Now they're going to be trucking it from the North slope. Um, do you think that they would truck it all the way to Anchorage? Would they create some kind of fur line from Fairbanks to Anchorage or would they truck it all the way down? What, what do you think? You know, physically you can truck it all the way down. Here's the pro the problem is as the cook inlet declines, it's all, I always get into these, you know, declines and, and increases. Declines and inclines. <laughs> He's talking but as, with hands again. He's <laughs> but as, but as cook inlet, uh, yeah, it really goes over really well in radio, right? To talk with hands. Um, uh, as Cook Inlet declines, um, uh, the, the stream of trucks you would have to have, the size of trucks and the stream of trucks you'd have to have uh, from the North Slope to meet Anchorage's demand uh, would be huge. I mean, you're talking about what's what's the project up in up up, up in Fairbanks that everybody's concerned about? All the trucks are going to be oh for Pogo, yeah, the the, the Pogo pro the project. Yeah. 
the new pro the new pogo project that uh, you know all these trucks are gonna be on the road as well you know you'd have both lanes you know with lng trucks coming down to me bumper to bumper lng truck all the way down <laughs> right. and be nothing but a string of non-stop lng trucks right so it's i mean fairbanks is one thing fairbanks uh respectfully has lowered let me just put it this way fairbanks has lower demand than anchorage does well they don't um, have in the market is, I mean, they're trying to do build outs and everything else, but they don't have the infrastructure to put everyone on gas as they have built out over the decades here in the South Central area. Well, yeah. And the electricity demand, you know, with all due respect, is lower than in, in it's, it's important, but it's lower in, in Fairbanks than it is in, in Anchorage. So it's, 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 it's really the size. I mean, you can put the trucks on the road, may have the occasional explosion. Uh, you can put the trucks on the road, uh, but, but the amount of trucks that you would have to have on the road to do this would be just, you know, astronomical. So right. that's, it, it's, 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 you know, if, if we go into a blackout crisis, maybe we can get some trucks down here and right. shave off the peak of the blackout, but but well, it's not a long-term you, solution. If you put a uh, if you put a floating gasification rig uh, down somewhere like you were talking about on a barge, uh couldn't you create a a, a a a liquefaction rig up on the north slope and and boat it around from the from the north slope down? I mean, would that make sense rather than over the ocean all the way from somewhere else? I mean, is it I don't know, is it feasible? I have no idea. Well, you got you got a couple of problems up at the slope. One is that it's shallow, uh, and that's always been a problem with LNG tankers, with getting LNG tankers up there. And the other part of it is, historically, it's been iced in. Uh, now the ice the ice is is less of an issue, but you still got an issue during you know a significant part of the year. You still got an ice issue up there, and you've got the you've got the shallowness issue. So, you know, it's 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 worth continuing to think about, but it's economics and it's size. I mean, you right. got to get enough gas into South central to meet the anchorage demand, to meet the electricity demand and the, and the natural gas demand. Um, and it's the economics of, of building a, a gasification, building a, a dock, you know, having ships because LNG tankers are huge, right? So you, if, if you wanted to try to, you know, try to use LNG to do it, but you had to deal with the, the, the shallowness issue and you had to deal with the ice issue. Maybe you got small, you have to have special purpose, smaller LNG tankers right. and the economics then just become very, very difficult. Well, yeah. If you have to build out new ships, that's a whole nother deal. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you, my friend for coming on board and joining us. Uh, sneak peek bonus segment up next uh, lifestyle, some fun stuff. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.